on page 51. As we approached the river from the highlands, everything appeared to be peaceful at the crossing below. We carefully made our way down a sharp descent of 2,000 feet via a track cut into the sheer side of a mountain. We crossed the bridge without incident, but were stopped on the opposite bank of the river by a resistance guard whose duty it was to check us for concealed weapons. He had a rifle swinging over his shoulder and looked very fierce and heroic. Though I couldn't help noticing that his uniform was not clean and shiny like the ones I remembered on the Chinese soldiers I'd seen in Darek. Everyone in our group was wearing layman's clothes, and there was nothing to suggest that our party contained monks or tulkus. One of our number was carrying a rolled-up religious painting, and the guard seemed to think it might be a rifle, so he insisted that it be unwrapped. He was mortified when he saw what it was, and realized that the person in front of him was a monk. He made a gesture of prayer with his hands and begged forgiveness. I think the mistake was harder for him than it was for any of us, though it certainly made me realize again that we were living in changing times. What we needed Trunkpa said in reply to the poor guard's offer to help in any way he could, was up-to-date information about the situation on the ground, both in rebel territory and in Lausa. The guard was confident that the region was safe from attack, and I couldn't help feeling reassured by this. Trungpa mentioned the rumor that His Holiness the Dalai Lama had been forced into exile in India and that Lhasa was under communist control. We don't believe it, I remember Trungpa saying, and the guard agreed that it was just Chinese propaganda. I looked around at our party, who were all now smiling and nodding their heads. I was the youngest person there, and accustomed to view my elders and lamas in particular as all-powerful and all-knowing. I didn't realize until I saw the wave of relief break over everyone that they had been so worried. The whereabouts of the Dalai Lama continued to be a great source of preoccupation for all of us throughout the next few months. His Holiness is revered by all Tibetans as a divine embodiment of wisdom and compassion, the glittering jewel of the land of snows. He was the very source of our faith and devotion. So the mere possibility that he might have fled was almost too awful to contemplate. With the guard's assurances, we all felt easier. Our anxiety was replaced by cautious optimism. Could it be that the tide had turned in our favor and things were not as bad as we had heard? We relaxed a little and began to enjoy the wonderful spring weather and the pleasure of traveling through unfamiliar 
terrain. I think now that we had all half convinced ourselves that we really were on pilgrimage. The one thing that puzzled us was that we didn't meet anybody returning from Lausa. We only passed other travelers who were also making their way towards it. Two days after we crossed the river, we reached the small town of Lodong, where we found more resistance troops, all of whom seemed to think that there was no need for us to escape. Trungpa and Akong looked thoughtful. The first time I saw a road was a week or so into our journey towards Lhasa. I was still overjoyed to be surrounded by trees and vegetation again, and I was lost in my contemplation of this beautiful world. Then we came across the road. I thought it looked unreal, as if an immensely long black scarf had been laid down over the mountains by some gigantic being. It was so utterly unlike the rest of the landscape. My horse's hooves looked out of place against this peculiar substance and the horse himself seemed confused. I glanced at Akon, but he seemed unperturbed as ever. He had made a number of journeys through our province over the previous two years. He must have seen tarred roads before. Probably he had seen cars as well. I could scarcely imagine such a thing. Trungpa had told me that he'd actually ridden in one. He and his attendant had hitched a lift in a communist jeep on the road from Chamdo when they were making their way to us in Dolmalaking almost a year before. It had amused him to sit in disguise next to soldiers from the same army that was hunting for him round his own monastery in Surmang. The sickening smell of the petrol was apparently even worse than the sensation of traveling at such a speed. Here there were no vehicles anywhere in sight, thank goodness. The resistance army had only horses and mules, as did we. From the moment we hit the main road to Lausa, everything felt more difficult. We passed hordes of desperate people with all their worldly belongings strapped to mules and yaks leaving the lands they had lived in for countless generations and heading nobody knew where. There were so many resistance soldiers going in both directions that there was no grazing for our animals. Food was expensive. Trungpa and Akung agreed that we should get off the road and continue our journey via a less traveled route. We made slow but steady progress westwards over mountain passes 
until finally the track ran out and we could go no further and had to drop back to the main road. We continued to push on towards Lausa, up and over the Sharkongla mountain range. The going was hard and slippery. The weather became stormy, but eventually we struggled over the crest of the pass at 18,000 feet. At camp the following day, Trunkpa, who had a pair of Russian field binoculars, spotted a group of people coming over the pass behind us. Every such moment was uneasy, since at a distance it was hard to be sure who anybody was. As the leader of the group drew closer, Trunkpa was astonished to see it was Yag Rinpoche, the abbot of Yag Monastery, where Trungpa had given teachings just before our escape. There was great joy when we heard that both Yag and Dromolakan Monastery remained untouched by the communists, though we could not be confident that this would last. As Yag Rinpoche told us that the fighting in Kham continued to be very bad. The worry increased when Yag Rinpoche said that his small party was just the vanguard of a much larger group of people, as well as hundreds of mules and a large number of yaks. I could see that both Akon and Trungpa were concerned at all of this. They had been advised by a number of other lamas to travel alone and with only a few attendants and a couple of animals. Now we would be part of a vast and slow-moving baggage train, impossible to conceal on the mountainside. The rest of the group was some days behind us, so Yagrimbache begged us to wait, and of course, Akon and Trungpa agreed. But... When they caught us up, even I was worried. The group of new arrivals contained another 150 or so people, including whole families with old people and babies. We were going to be slow, and thanks to the babies' cries, we would also be noisy. There were hundreds of animals, all of which would need grazing. The survival of everyone depended on our evading attention, and now it seemed impossible that we would. There was nothing to be done except press on, and after a few days we came to a village called Langsoka where we camped by a small lake surrounded by rocky hills. I have vivid memories of going on long walks with Trungpa and Akong through valleys bursting with spring flowers. It was early June, and the landscape was a mass of color that reminded me of summer in the hills above Darek. I loved being invited to spend time with Trungpa and Akong and felt a strong sense of peace and well-being. Despite the context of fear and uncertainty. The local landowner was extremely hospitable to us and invited Akong Rinpoche Trungpa Rinpoche, Yag Rinpoche, and a few others of our party, including me, to eat with him. He also allowed us to graze our animals on his land. These were the last days of peace I would know for many months. Our struggle was about to become far more acute.
We had hit a huge obstacle. The track we were following led directly through a gorge on the Sangpo River, where travelers had to cross the torrents of water using a primitive bridge. It was just one plank wide at its midpoint, and there were no hand rails. Old people and children might be coaxed over or carried, but it would be extremely dangerous. Could the animals manage the crossing? Would the bridge bear the weight of heavily laden yaks? These considerations were not even the greatest problem. The bridge had to be crossed in single file and without overcrowding. After we had been camped for a few days, a queue of hundreds of refugees and fighters began to form on the opposite side of the river. As they streamed over, they brought confirmation that Lausa had fallen to the communists. Though nobody seemed certain whether His Holiness the Dalai Lama had been captured or had escaped. Thousands of people were pouring down the valley and there was no way our enormous party could push against the tide. Why would we want to, when our destination, Lhasa, was in enemy hands, and the Dalai Lama's whereabouts were unknown? The mood turned black. This was the moment I grasped that the future was not certain. Up to this point I had been swept along by my persisting sense of relief and excitement at being out of Dolmalakan. I trusted that my brother and Trungpa would continue to guide us, as they always had. And whenever I allowed myself to think about the wider situation, I simply couldn't imagine that I was living through the destruction of my world. That seemed impossible. All this complacency crumbled when I heard that Lausa had been captured. Where should we go now? We could not go on, but neither could we stay where we were for long. The narrow valley would not support our large group despite the landowner's generosity. Besides, he was becoming nervous as the news grew worse. We would have to find an alternative route, but with no destination in mind, it was difficult to know which way to go. That night I thought of Derek. For the first time it dawned on me that I might never go there or see my parents and sisters again. They, along with my other brother, Paulden Drakpa, were cut off, and there was no way to reach them. What would happen to them all? For once Jam Yang could offer me no consolation. He just shook his head when I asked him what he thought would happen to our family. Trungpa was the undoubted leader of our group and was supported in his decision-making by Akon and Yag Rinpoche. Both he and Akon were still only twenty years old, but Trungpa was the highest lama, the most skilled at divinations, and a gifted and inspiring leader. It was natural for him to assume command. He now decided that we should retrace our steps and then take a different route, going northwest over many high
passes. Lausa may have fallen, but it was still unclear where else we could go. Looking back, I can see that it must have been a situation of terrible pressure for Trumpa. He was naturally brilliant. His resolve and intuition had been strengthened by the intense training he had received in the monastery system. But he was young, and now he had responsibility for hundreds of people. No wonder he could not, as yet, think beyond Lausa as a destination. The route over the mountains was harder going than the valley pass we had been forced to abandon, and it took a week to slog through the highlands until we reached another valley that allowed us to change course and head westward once again. Then we received two pieces of devastating news in quick succession. Travelers coming east confirmed that the communists were in control of the main route to Lausa and that if we continued we would certainly be captured as we were walking straight into the enemy's ranks. We had run out of any plausible reason for continuing our course in that direction. Every hour more and more refugees were arriving and halting to absorb the impact of the news. There was total confusion. Trungpa and Akung spoke with several other lamas, but there was no consensus on what to do or where to go. This was one of those moments in life that happened to many of us, in different contexts, when we realize that those we trust to lead us or care for us do not know what to do about a difficult situation. For many of us, the first such moment is when we realize that our parents are not infallible. During times of political crisis, we might feel that we are lurching from one moment to another. As I observed the debate between the lamas, all of whom had different opinions, I felt as if the boundaries of my world were crumbling. Continuing from page 53 of From a Mountain in Tibet. It must have been quite, quite an adventure, adventure for them, travelling all along. And they didn't have, and they didn't even have maps or, or compasses. So uh, no wonder they were, they were getting getting mixed up with, with directions to go. You know. Yes. It's amazing that Trungpa had binoculars, wasn't it? That's right. I thought that was very uh, clever of him because even though it didn't sound like they were planning an escape. He had the equipment that was necessary that he could get access to. That's, that's right, yeah. yeah. What a world of difference that would I have mean, made. It would have been helpful when they're turning to check back in the journey. They're not being followed by anybody. They haven't been up. They can see a distance before they come. That's true. Yeah. To get some prep. That's right. Because then if something's approaching, they have an idea before it reaches them that's, that's what right. it might be. Yeah, that's right. And it must have been some some experience uh, to see a, 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 a driven vehicle for the first time. Yes, and the road too. That left an impression yeah, on Lamia. Yes, you were sure, didn't you? Tar Macadam. Tar Macadam. You've never seen a road before, a paved yeah. road. Yeah, yeah. You've only seen animal tracks. That's right. Or yeah. making one's way through the landscape without any uh, any road. Y yeah. Yeah, you have to have left, abandoned the road at, at any time because it's so e easy, easy for them to get caught travelling these easy, easy roadways, you know. Yes, yeah, they, they have to get off the beaten track and so, so the, the, the Chinese don't know where, where they're going, you know. That's right. Now, both Akon Rinpoche and, and Trungpa Rinpoche seem to be aware of that. Yeah, that's They have right. very good uh, sense about where, how they had to proceed. That's right, yeah. I could all, all these thoughts and ideas come out of Lama Yes's mind. Uh, 
and, you know, and then I got them, I really got them, got them thinking what's up, what's really happening, you know. And then he's thinking of his family, and then he's thinking of what other things, you know. And then he, and he was confused, wonder, wondering if they're ever going to escape. But, you know, this bad news coming, you know, about the last are getting took over, the Dalai Lama and the Kamap have already, already fled, you know. So, so I was, was a bit awkward, you know, but all these other people coming. It was better to travel with just a few and a few animals. That's right. But with all that, well, what could they do? But really, nobody really know really sure what was, what was happening, you know. A lot of chaos. Yeah, a lot of chaos. They were just travelling and hoping, hoping and hoping, you know, that they would, would, would get free, they would get free, but actually, they looked, looked very, very promising the way they were travelling, you know. Yes. I didn't think that at all. They were lucky that Tibet was a big open space, weren't they? Because yeah. there was a lot of protection in just being in a landscape that was so big. That's right. They I could stay somewhat secluded for part of their journey anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, it was a pity that they didn't have advantage of that, that early get away, getting away much earlier, you know. It would have been part, part of an advantage, you know, they had, you know. Yes. But then, as I said, the commitments to fulfill, we had to, to see to all that, you know. And that sort of, uh, sort of holds things back a bit, you know. You know, and then of course all, all, all these people coming. That is an, an unbelievable burden, burden for trying to escape. You know? Yes. Well, they were lucky they hadn't crossed that bridge, weren't they? If they were going to then have to turn around and yeah. cross it back going the other way. I wonder if you Mar Marpa's route that Marpa took when he went to India. Well, they haven't yet decided they're going to India. They're still heading in another direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I think, I think, I think it must be in the back of their mind that they'll be heading for India, though. As soon as they hear Karmapa has gone. Aye. I think it's the back of their mind that that may be, may be, you know. Yes. Yes. They'll have to start traveling south, though. Yeah. They're still going west. Then if they know anything, then they do, once they've made their mind up about they're going to go to India, they may know about Marpa's route. Yes. You know? Yes. Oh, well, so maybe later on we may find some more, more information about that, right? Yes. <laughs> so you're, you're curious about uh, asking Lama Yeshi Rinpoche if, if Marpa's route to India and maybe the other early translators was a part of the stories that might have been told in Tibet about mm -hmm. these uh, historical figures who did travel previously, not under the same circumstances, but certainly with a lot of difficulties to get to a place that was not very accessible or very familiar to Tibetans. It wasn't an everyday thing to travel in that direction. Yeah. Even, even the route that Mark Patrick was, was very dangerous too, you know, even though it, 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 it was, it was not to do with the Chinese, but it was very dangerous. That's correct. Travel was a, yeah. a very challenging thing to do. Yes, right. I thought it was a, a, a lovely connection between the past and the, and the present, because when Lama Yeshe Rinpoche has groups come to Holy Isle, they love to take walks with him, long walks with him. Mm -hmm. So it was very nice to hear that he had the same thing with Trungpa and mm -hmm. Akram Rinpoche. Yeah. And that was a way that they were out in the beauty of the na natural world yeah. and enjoying each other's company. And it's something that Lama Yeshe Rinpoche has continued to do here on the Holy Isle at a later part of his life and yeah. something that people have just so much appreciated yeah. that he's out in the outdoors with them and whatever stories come to mind or whatever experiences and just being in the beauty of it all. Yeah. It's a lovely thread running through from this earlier time. That's right. It must have been very special to have had those moments with uh, his with brother and Trungpa Rinpoche. Uh, that's right. They were very special moments for him, I'm sure. And then probably later on have a lot more to say about that. Why not? Yes. <laughs> Is there anything else you wanted to say about this section? 
it was much much of it traveling I think in a, in a, an adventure but uh, I think we've covered 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 that lots of challenges challenges I you know the bad news that kept coming up you know and amazing how both Rinpoches, both Rinpoches rose to the occasion and were able to remain calm. So maybe, maybe later, later on they might have all decided, seeing, seeing the problem we've been so many, decided to split up and go their own, their own, their own routes, their own direction. I think they might have done that later on, you know. We'll see. We'll see. It's very exciting anyway. <laughs> So, Lomi Ishimshe, you're holding our attention as we read through this book because the story is very compelling and there's a great deal of suspense and it's also very inspiring to be aware of how both he and his brother and everybody else responded, especially those who were able to remain calm and think clearly in a very, very challenging situation. I don't think I didn't hope to get all these pack animals to their destination. <laughs> no, no way. I think I did not But anyway, we'll soon find out later, later on in the book what, what happened with Rimpish's pack animals and their, and their stuff. We haven't heard that yet, but we'll find out. We're looking forward to that, Lama Yoshi. <laughs> yes. Thank you for telling us this story. We're very much enjoying it. And as you can see, we're having questions along the way, so we look forward to hearing more and discovering even more about this period of time. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay then. Okay.